the stage is yours. All right, thank you very much. Oh, very nice to be back. Uh, first openly gay president of the Oxford Union. That, that, that's happened since I was here last. But I, some of you who are more uh, uh, savvy with the internet than I will perhaps be surprised uh, that I'm here because, according to the internet, I died last week. <laughs> <laughs> Dead from cardiac arrest. Um, <laughs> I heard about this. I, 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 it also says that I'm going to be the next James Bond. <laughs> oh, uh, and I've announced my retirement. And, and my dog is recovering from surgery. <laughs> and that I've asked people to pray for him. <laughs> well, I love dogs, but I'm an atheist. I, that's <laughs> oh, and my girlfriend is pregnant. <laughs> And uh, for the second year running, I'm the sexiest actor alive. <laughs> and then it says, update, this story seems to be false. <laughs> <laughs> well, never mind. Uh, what else does it say about me? Uh, oh, I'm going to be Time Man of the Year, you know, on the cover of uh, Time magazine. And my favourite is that uh, um, I am the richest actor in the world. <laughs> now let me find this because, uh, yes, I'm, uh, I have assets of 183 million pounds. I have my own football team. <laughs> uh, what else do I have? Oh, yes, I have a... Sorry. I told you I'm not very good at this, but uh, it, it amuses me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll stop it in a minute. Oh, dear, where, where is it that I wanted to read it to you? Uh, no sexist actual life, yes. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, yes, here we are. McKellen is the highest paid actor in the world with an estimated net worth of 185 million. He owes his fortune to smart stock investments, substantial, substantial property holdings, lucrative endorsement deals with cover girl cosmetics. <laughs> he also owns several restaurants, the fat McKellen burger chain. <laughs> He's launched his own brand of vodka, Pure Wonder McKellen, UK, and is tackling the juniors market with a top-selling perfume with love from Ian and a fashion line called, a fashion line called Ian McKellen Seduction. <laughs> I was wondering what to say to you, so I, I looked at the last time I was here. And it's all on, uh, it's all on, on, on YouTube, thanks to uh, the, the, the union's uh, modernity. And, and I talk for 40 minutes about here uh, without notes, and I'm absolutely brilliant. And <laughs> there's hardly any point in me coming back. So if, if you want to know what I would like to say, just have a look at that. It's all there. <laughs> uh, so this time, uh, I think, have you explained what we might do? What that you're talking for, 20 minutes? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you for a bit, and then we're going to have a little conversation, and then... I hope we'll have a conversation, and uh, that's probably better because uh, I can get to actually answer questions that you would like to have uh, answered. Uh, what have I been doing since I was last with you? Much of the same, really. I've just played King Lear. This is real. <laughs> the, uh, the Gandalf beard, of course, was not. Uh, <laughs> You didn't know everybody in Lord of the Rings wore a wig. All those thousands of people. And they all, they all wore uh, uh, artificial hair. Uh, and that was the big bore of, of doing uh, 
playing Gandalf, really, as I had to go in very early and have everything stuck on. And it itched badly, as this does, actually. I don't recommend a beard. Um, I hope they don't come back into fashion. This is going quite soon. It depends whether we transfer uh, our production or not from Chichester. Um, yes, so I've been acting a little bit. I've decided not to write my uh, uh, autobiography. I, I put nine months aside to do it, but I got so upset when I was writing about my parents before I was born, imagining their life just before the Second World War and the... And the in South Lancashire, where I was born, eventually. I'm wondering whether they discussed, did we want to bring another baby into the world just as it's about to change and there's about to be a Second World War? I'd never asked them, you know. Someone was just saying, what advice would you have to someone at the outset of their careers? I think, talk to your parents. Find out what they were like when they were your age. It may seem odd thing to do now, but you'll regret it if you don't. Eventually you'll want to look back and they won't be here to answer the questions. Talk to your grandparents. Um, find out things that, if you get to my age, you will never be able to discover because everyone will have died. Uh, so take advantage of them being alive now. Um, so I then eventually decided not to write the autobiography because I, I got so upset on behalf of my dear mother who died when she was 42. And my dad, when, he was, when I was 24, oh dear, it's a big regret of my life I didn't have a proper relationship with them as an adult, you know. Never came out to them. Never gave my dad the chance to say, that's okay. Give me a hug. And that's why... Uh, <laughs> I spent a lot of time with, with, with young people in schools. I've, I've just been to the Oxford uh, High School for Girls this afternoon. Uh, the whole school turned out. They were in three halls. They, they, they were having a, a relay system. So I was talking to the 11-year-olds up to the 18-year-olds. They were all there. And their teachers around the side. And the governors. And some parents came along. <laughs> and all I did was talk about what it had been like growing up and the sort of school I went to and how lucky they were to be living in a country with the best laws with regard to gay people, I think, anywhere in the world. Uh, and so I enjoy doing that, frankly, which is not acting. It's performing, but it's not acting. Uh, as much as I do uh, pretending to be somebody else uh, on screen or uh, on stage. Although I'll let you into a, a secret. I, I, I discovered something in King Lear, which is, uh, I'm going to have to develop in some way in, in, in other plays, I think. It's expected uh, in these post-Freudian days that we live in that actors will, following the method, um, delve into the backstory of the character. You know. <coughs> now, it's an odd thing to do that with Shakespeare because Shakespeare wouldn't have known what you meant by character. The play just happened, the action just happened. Uh, and to delve into the past isn't very helpful. I mean, King Lear, why did he not have his first daughter until he was 40 years old, you might ask? Why did he have his second daughter when he was 60 years old? They couldn't have had the same mother. Oh, he had two wives. Who are they? What are they called? What were they like? Don't know. I used to wear two wedding rings for the observant, but... It's no help if you're playing King Lear to know that you had two wives. It's nothing to do with the story. And I think what's a good way of approaching Shakespeare, whether you're studying him, reading him, or acting in him, or, or going to see him in the theatre, is to say, once upon a time, there was an old king, and he had three daughters, and he loved one best of all. And he decided to retire and he divided the kingdom into three. And it all went wrong. <laughs> so always in Shakespeare you're looking to the next scene. You're always moving forward. You're moving to the end of the line. Uh, and looking back is no help uh, to anybody. 
So, this time, for the first time in my life, I didn't think, uh, what sort of person is King Lear? Does he have a limp? What's his heart like? What's his favourite food? These are the sort of questions I often ask. And the, the audience never gets to know the answers, but I know them, so it sort of comforts me that I'm being real. But I decided on this occasion not to be real, but to say the lines. That's all. And you know, if you say the lines and live in the moment, and don't say to yourself, why am I saying this, but rather, how am I saying it, and will people understand it? Oh, am I furious? That's the interesting thing. It came from a, a suggestion the director made. He said, surprise yourself. Don't know, which is the normal method, the inevitability of doing what you do because you know the backstory. Surprise yourself. And it really worked. And it allowed the audience to write the play, oddly. And people said to me, I loved the moment where you remembered your fool, the dead fool, King Lear's best friend at the beginning of the play, who vanishes halfway through. And I said, well, what do you mean? Well, and they referred to something that I'd done that didn't mean that to me, but did to them. In other words, they'd written the play a little bit. And there was a heightened attention uh, from, from the audience that I hadn't noticed before. Mind you, we were doing it in a small theatre, half the size of, of this uh, debating chamber. So I just passed that on. That's how I played King Lear, and I had some of the best reviews of my life for acting. But I wasn't acting, really. I was just saying the lines. Uh, so I'm going to try and do more of that. Uh, and I don't know whether it would work with lesser writers. It probably wouldn't. Often with plays, if they're not by Shakespeare or by Anton Chekhov, you're, the actors are often having to fill in a few of the gaps, you know, lead the audience over the chasms of nonsense that uh, lesser playwrights uh, land you with. <laughs> but as I may have said before, and I often have that, when I die, it's going to say on my tombstone, uh, here lies Gandalf, he came out. <laughs> I'm known as Gandalf, but I think of myself as a, as a gay man. Uh, perhaps because I didn't come out till I was 49. 49! <gasps> Jesus. Couldn't happen today, could it? Well, I hope to no one in this room. Don't wait. Come on, get it out. Be honest. Be open. Tell everybody. Run up the flag. I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm lesbian, or I'm bi. I don't care what you are. But <laughs> I think we only have labels because uh, other people give labels, you know? Uh, when, I was, when I was a kid, if anyone noticed me at all, or my kind, they were at the point uh, queer. Not a very nice word. Not for a young person to cope with. Queer. What can you do about it? And uh, I was talking to some uh, school in Brighton, actually. <laughs> First question I always ask when I go to the school, ask the head teacher. They sometimes get a bit alarmed. I say, uh, how many openly gay members of staff do you have? I, 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 oh, I, 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 <laughs> this very confident head teacher said, 43. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to go to that school. Uh, well, I did. And <laughs> I said, and how many openly... Uh, gay students have you got? 125. 125 kids know what they are. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God, what a way to start your life. But talking to a little group afterwards, I was sitting opposite a, a tough little girl, a boy called Finn. Short hair, jeans, sneakers. 
And apparently six months before, he'd been a tough little girl called Finn. He was going through that journey of gender identification and dragging the whole school with him. Well, how much better is their lives going to be when they know, you know, in their early teens that they have a friend like that? This is the new United Kingdom that I could not have imagined when I was at school where to be gay was to be, well, it was a word we didn't know. To be queer was to be ostracised and therefore not, never to be talked about. My best friend at school was gay, I never found out until 35 years later. Then there's the boy on my left at this little meeting, George. He's 15 or 16, and he said, well, what, what do you do if your mummy is lesbian? And yesterday, <coughs> yesterday your daddy says that he's gay. Oh, dear. I said, it'll be all right, George. <laughs> and it will, because he could talk about it. And that's what the teacher said to him. Well done, George. We'll talk about that later. And then there were three girls on my right. Tough little sassy 16-year-old, just out of uniform. Yeah. And the one in the middle said, now nah, look here, I'm talking about on behalf of these two. We are bi. <laughs> Good. But, she said, look, if I'm, if I'm with my boyfriend, presumably, I'm, I'm straight, am I? And then if I'm with a girlfriend, presumably, I'm lesbian. We don't want these labels. And a light went on in my head. Of course. Why the, do we have labels? The only label any of us needs is our name. We don't need labels, really. L, G, B, T, Q, I. Where's it going to stop? Don't have labels. We're just people. Don't make any assumptions. Even if you see gay on the label, or queer, or other, don't make any assumptions that that'll be the same next week. People may change. They may want to identify themselves in another way, or behave in another way. Yeah, that's what life's about, finding out. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's now my message to school, get rid of the labels. But I've, I, I get so excited to be British, because it's our country that have some of the best laws in the land, protecting the rights of everybody to be whatever they are and put whatever label they want and not to be discriminated against. It's against the law to discriminate against people on grounds of sexuality in a state-maintained school. Bullying on those grounds is illegal. It has to be dealt with. And teachers who spent a whole generation of their career following the obscene rules of Section 28, which said you may not discuss sexuality positively in a state-maintained school, that is past. Now, we've not quite got there. Uh, anyone from Northern Ireland here? Well, uh, you can't get married in Northern Ireland if you're gay. Haven't quite got there yet. And uh, one of the political parties who resisted changing the law, as they should have done, of course, was the DUP. And without the DUP, our present government wouldn't be in charge. So don't look to Northern Ireland for immediate advance for gay people. But with the exception of that, our laws are superior to any others that I know. And attitudes uh, are changing with them. Of course, uh, gay people are still bullied in private and in public places. They have acid thrown in their faces. They get tripped up. They do, in extreme cases, get killed. But on the whole, you can't say anything anti-gay in a public place without being reprimanded. Quite right. Uh, yet you go around the world, 
Russia under Putin, with the encouragement of the Orthodox uh, Church there, who have been so repressed for so long under communism that now they want nothing more than to repress other people's lives, have passed a law which is, could as well be called Section 28 because it has exactly the same wording and makes it illegal throughout Russia to speak positively about homosexuality in the hearing of anyone under the age of 18. So the law of the land in Russia is that young people should be kept ignorant about the real world, kept ignorant about themselves, ignorant about the sexuality of their brothers, their sisters, their aunts, their uncles, their friends, people in high places, people in low places, people probably running the bloody Orthodox Church. They've gone back into the Middle Ages. Don't let anyone tell you Putin is a good, strong leader. Strong, maybe, good. <laughs> i just come back from India. They're trying to change a, a, a law which uh, disadvantages gay people and says that uh, we're inferior and we shouldn't be allowed to do certain jobs and so on, so on, so on. And uh, some politicians said, McKellen, don't come over to us and tell us how to run our country. We have our own in Indian laws and uh, don't come over with your Western attitudes. And you say, no, it's not your law. It's a law that the British Empire imposed on you and left behind. Before the empire, there were no anti-gay laws in India. We introduced them. I said, I've come here to apologise and take it back. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, tr that's true of African countries too. They're defending the bad law that we left behind, supported by the local churches. Oh, which make it so difficult for the poor old Anglican church sitting in Lambeth to do what, of course, it would longs to do, which is to accept gay people into its fold. Can't because of the pressures from the Anglican communion uh, in Africa and elsewhere. Same sort of pressures, I suspect, on the Pope. If he were inclined to change the teachings of his church, I was just asked earlier what was, the, what was the most, the best moment in my life or something. Well, uh, I'll tell you about one of them. It was in South Africa. Uh, uh, Nelson Mandela had not long been uh, out of prison and he'd been appointed, uh, voted in as president of uh, the new Republic of South Africa after years of apartheid and the ill treatment of and discrimination against black people. Well, now they had their own president. And a new constitution was due, and there was a committee formed to try and get pushed into the constitution, uh, a, a rule which would say it would be against the law to discriminate against, uh, on the grounds of uh, sexuality. And they needed a bit of money to, to do their campaign, and I, I went over and I was doing a one-man show to raise a few funds, and one day the organiser said, uh, would you go and lobby the president? What? Would I go to Johannesburg on my day off and talk to Nelson Mandela about non-discrimination? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I said, not on my own, I won't, no. So I went with Pumzeli and Tetra, who's a wonderful black uh, um, law student at Wits University, uh, and a friend, of, now dead, alas, uh, the late Simon Nkoli, who'd been a freedom fighter under uh, the direction of the ANC, uh, but was an openly gay young man. <coughs> and the three of us went to Johannesburg and we were invited to leave our guns uh, uh, at the reception desk and any live ammunition we had with us and up we went in the elevator and we were told the president would see us and in we went. It was shocking how old he was, uh, the hair was white now, uh, half blind in one eye as the, as the uh, 
digging the, the lime in, in, in Ron Robin Island. Uh, his ankles weren't of their best, but he was wearing lovely striped socks, I remember. A bit of a dandy. Come in, come in, sit down. We talked about the weather. I'd been warned that he might start giggling once we talked about uh, homosexuality because he found the whole subject a bit funny. He's of that generation. But eventually we, we got around to talking about it and explaining about it. I said, so do you think when we leave the meeting we can tell the media that you support this uh, new law of no discrimination against gay people in the Constitution? He said, of course. Well, of course, you don't spend all your life, you don't pick up arms, you don't stay in prison for 27 years in support of the idea that white people and black people should be treated the same, and then say of gay people that they should be treated differently. Of course not. And that was my little contribution to history, because... Uh, South Africa is the first country in the world to have it in its constitution that you may not discriminate on grounds of sexuality. Out of the misery of apartheid came that hope and that uh, beacon for change which the rest of us are gradually getting around. South Africa was there first and, uh, you know, in the darkest days when everything seems impossible, when you think, can it ever get better? Yeah, it can. It can. Um, but it takes time. Our foreign office is terribly good. I've just been staying with the uh, ambassador, 47-year-old single woman, straight, in Rome. And she had a reception for me there. She invited local gay activists, and we, we spoke about this and that, and the future. Conducted by our ambassador, on our behalf, because one of the things she's most proud of and can sell Britain on is, is not, our, <laughs> not our politics, but our acceptance of difference, acceptance, celebration of diversity. And it's part of her job to sell our country on those uh, on those grounds. So I, I know I'm Pollyanna. I, I, I think it's always go it's always going to be better. But I think on the evidence uh, it is. Thank you. Firstly, thank you so much, Ian, uh, for joining us at the Oxford Uni again. I must say, your shoelaces are fantastic. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to get some But myself, you know what they are? They're, 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 they're freedom laces, I think they're called. You get them on the Stonewall website. They're, they're very long, that's why they're double knotted, because they're actually football boot laces. And uh, members of the FA once a year encourage their football players to support the idea of diversity by wearing them when they're playing. The irony, of course, is that there isn't yet uh, a player in the Premier League who's found able to come out. Isn't that amazing? Not a single football player in this country out. And why? Well, they're frightened of the, frightened of the reaction from the... From the uh, Fans, better to keep their head down. Then they're frightened that they won't be allowed to, um, sp uh, Adidas won't sponsor them anymore. Well, I've news, good news for them. The first gay player who comes out will become the most famous player in the world and every single sports company will be begging him uh, to sponsor their, uh, to, to, to wear their clothes. Uh, but in the meantime, they're scared. For the same reason that M uh, members of Parliament used to be scared. 
Oh, I'll never get re-elected. Yes, you will. <laughs> Actors. Oh, I, I'll, I'll never be allowed to have a film career. Yes, you can. <laughs> Uh, you, you mentioned that fear uh, about coming out as gay and actually I think where we've seen a shift is that people coming out, certainly I think in our generation, is not, they're not necessarily fearful of being discriminated against. Right. What the fear is, is you have a perception that you've grown up with because you're automatically assumed straight until you say otherwise. Yeah. And uh, if you get to 16 and you've always been assumed say, uh, straight and you've, you've adopted that perception, the fear is saying to your friend, I'm not what you and I probably convince you to be. I'm not actually as straight. You might even do things that would suggest that you're straight when actually you know deep down that you're gay. So I, that, that's certainly my experience. So I don't know, there prob probably is, uh, are people out there who have a similar fear. Yeah. What would you say and uh, how would you overcome that? Well, uh, you know, if, if, if you, you might have some news for your friends that would surprise them of other sorts. You know, I'm going to live in America. Oh, are you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm going to get a job where I don't get paid much money because it's something I really want to do. Oh, really? I'm gay. Yep. So am I! <laughs> and if they don't like it, get some new friends. There are plenty of, plenty of friends out there. Well, I think the difference is that whereas saying, oh, I'm going to America, um, people actually say, I'm straight, if anyone asks, until they, ha they, they themselves yeah. come to decide, I'm going to come out now. now and so having find, said to a friend... Do you find this, that, that you're, you're still having to come out to people because yeah, yeah. they make... The, yeah. They make the assumption well, that, oh, actually... Well, because that will go on for the rest of your life. So... <laughs> you, you can't run up the flag on the flagpole. I am gay. No, not enough people see it. You, you, you have to keep saying it. I, I was coming home at three in the morning in a cab the other day. Oh, worse than worse, sitting in the back. And the cabbie recognised me and said, Hello, Ian. Oh, dear, hello, yes. Uh, <laughs> He said, I've always been meaning to ask you, have you got any grandchildren? <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> Do I have to start explaining to a, a black cab driver that, no, I don't have any grandchildren because I don't have any children because I'm gay, and when I was a, a, might have had children, it was illegal to be, for me to have children. In other words, am I going to come out to this cab driver at three o'clock in the morning? <laughs> because I don't know what the reaction is going to be, but I plucked up my courage and said, no, mate, sorry, no, I don't have grandchildren, I don't have children because I'm gay. And he said, yes, so am I. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, life is uh, more unexpected than you'd think. It can, um, uh, sorry. <laughs> well, m maybe if you just wear these shoelaces all the time, ah, and people well, yes, that, that's I'll wear point. a scarf that's rainbow coloured, just so yes, everybody... Yes, yes, that's right, yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you, you obviously, it's quite clear from just what you've spoken about this evening and just anyone who's, who's looked you up, that your focus in terms of your activism is on LGBTQ uh, yeah. activism. But you, you do support a lot of causes uh, that aren't to do with uh, sexuality. Right, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can name a couple, but um, yeah, okay. you, you, w what was it that, was it just because you're gay that that was the reason you focused on LGBTQ activism in particular? Mm. Because there are so many other causes that are just as important, in my opinion. Well, but you know, in you my could've... time, I have gone on marches against VAT on theatre ticket prices. <laughs> One of the nonsenses in our country is that if you want to read Shakespeare, you don't have to pay VAT. If you want to see him in the theatre, you have to pay VAT. That's a bit of a cause. <laughs> I've walked on anti-nuclear marches. I've written to my MP on various matters. I'm a vegetarian. I, I uh, on the whole, vote Labour. Uh, uh, I'm a pacifist. On the whole, I, I would refuse to serve in the armed forces if it was a requirement. But I don't go on about those things very much, except privately and to my friends. The, the only two issues that I really talk about are on, about um, 
the business of acting and, 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 and related matters uh, and being gay. I think that's enough for me because I, I, I can speak with authority. You can't tell me I'm wrong on, on gay stuff. I'm right. <laughs> And, and, and there are very, very, very few things in my life where I can say, yes, this is it. I can't decide whether to have a boiled egg or scramble it, you know. <laughs> but on gay stuff, I know I'm right. So I, I think that's my contribution, uh, my, 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 where my experience is, is, is valid. And elsewhere, I think, well, my opinion's as good as anybody else's, really. One thing I, I have to ask your opinion on, um, recently, um, Kevin Spacey um, revealed that he was gay, um, but did so in, in what a lot of people have criticised as, as bad circumstances. What th do you think of the way that Kevin Spacey came out as gay, and, and how can other celebrities avoid doing what he did? It's not something I want to talk about in public. I, it's, a, it's a complicated issue. I, I, I've worked for Kevin Spacey uh, at, when he was running the, the Old Vic, and I was in pantomime there. Uh, I think it's a matter of celebration when anybody comes out because their life is going to be better. But the circumstances in which he chose to do it are, uh, I suppose you could say, reprehensible because it, it linked uh, alleged uh, uh, underage sex with uh, a declaration of, of sexuality. And that's murky and, and, and not desirable. But otherwise, uh, I really don't want to comment because I don't think anything I could say could uh, improve the matter for him or for anyone who says that he was a victim. Um, it's my understanding that last time you were here, uh, a student stood up with yes, they did, friends, right here. friends either side and uh, came out as gay Wonderful. Um, to everyone, which, which when I heard, I didn't get in, but when I heard that happened, I thought it was fantastic. Yeah. And I actually thought there must be quite a few moments through whenever you're giving presentations at schools or similar um, presentations such as this, yeah. where you are brimming with pride and you see that. I was wondering if you have any particular moments in mind that you remember sort of those courageous acts happening. If anyone wants this up now, Jay. <laughs> you know, the, the, there was an evangelical preacher called uh, Billy Graham, and, and he used to uh, pitch his tent around the world and, and invite people to give themselves to Christ by coming forward. Uh, and and they, they, would, they, would, they would raise the temperature with uh, choir singing and, and everyone swaying, and, and, and he said, come and give yourself to Jesus. And they would come forward, and once there, they would be given the local church to go to, and they would be saved, as it were. And I've often thought... It'd be a great idea to, to go around the country with, with, with the coming out gay tent. <laughs> and Elton uh, and I and Claire Balding would <laughs> all be there at the front say, come on, come out, come out. <laughs> and people would come forward. And of course, once they'd done that, they couldn't go back in. Uh, they, we'd have got them for life. <laughs> and that was at a time when it was important for people to come out because we wanted to show the rest of the country that there were a lot of us. There was a time when there only seemed to be about 10 gay people in this country. <laughs> and I didn't get to meet all of them. Um, <laughs> but I, I was at a school and I was saying, you know, there's not a single member of staff who's out. And, and why? Because like the footballer who's frightened of, of the reaction of the, uh, of the fans, like the MP who thinks he or she will never get another, never get elected back into Parliament, they're frightened of what uh, the students will think. They think their authority will go. They think you'll laugh at them. And at that point, a young man, a young man put his hand up at the back. I thought he was a student, but no, he was a young teacher. He said, he said uh, I teach here and I'm gay. There was that silence. And they all turned around and they started to clap and cheer and his life will never be the same again and nor will that school and I don't think he'll have any problem at all. And that was, that was uh, thrilling. He, he was obviously ready, he was ready and, and, and the event just pushed him over into uh, joining the human race really. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, 
I don't want to take up too much of time asking questions. I know how many people are in here. And I guess they'll probably ask about acting and probably Lord of the Rings as well. Oh, yeah. So I'll, I'll leave the questions then. So now we're going to open up uh, to the audience for questions. So if you have a question, raise your hand nice and high. Um, more importantly, wait until the microphone uh, comes to you. Yeah, let's start with you in the purple scarf. Yeah. Hi, it's an honor. Um, I do want to say, I guess <laughs> it happened last time, but I am bisexual, and I think it's the first time I've ever said it in public. Um, so I don't know, you thought it'd be really great. Um, my question to you is a little bit more serious. I know you didn't want to speak about Kevin Spacey, which makes absolute sense because you worked with him and it's a comp very complicated situation. But I do, you know, you're an actor and you've been in the business for a very, very long time. And, um, I, you know, the... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> in an incredible way, you're, cool. you're an absolute legend. Um, but... <laughs> um, the wave, you know, of allegations that have come out, you know, women and men coming forward and, you know, talking about how Hollywood is a very insidious place with full of sexual violence. Um, I wonder if you had any comments about that, you know, about the Weinstein scandal and about all these other, you know, directors and actors as well. If there's anything you really would like to say. No, I, I you know, it's... Uh, of course, uh, people taking advantage of their power is utterly reprehensible, wherever it happens. Within the family, Father and his children? Awful lot of that. Not thank goodness in my family. In the workplace? It doesn't have to be the theatre. It doesn't have to be Hollywood. <clears throat> it can be the local shop. It can be Parliament. I, I, it won't do, wherever it happens. And uh, people must be called out. And it's very, very, uh, sometimes very difficult for victims to do that. And I know what's particularly painful to some people who were abused and didn't talk about it and, and never got it out of their system and, 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 and feel it. Maybe decades later, when they read about abuse in the newspaper, it all comes flooding back. And psych uh, psychiatrists will tell you that, 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 that uh, their books are full of people who are hurt by revelations of other people's experience. I hope we're going through a period which will sort of help to eradicate it altogether. But just one tiny thing from my own experience. Uh, when I was starting acting in 19, early 1960s, uh, the, the director of, of, of the theatre I was working at showed me some, let, some uh, photographs he got from uh, women who were wanting jobs. They were a a actors. And some of them had, I think these were the initials, uh, 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 at the bottom of their photograph, D-R-R. -R. D -R -R. Director's rights respected. In other words, if you give me a job, you can have sex with me. That was commonplace from people who proposed that they should be a victim. <laughs> I mean, madness. D-R-R. -R. Director's rights respected. So people have taken advantage of that and encouraged it, and uh, it absolutely will not do. I, I just assume nothing but good can come out of these revelations. Uh, even though some people, of course, get wrongly accused. Uh, there's, there's that side of it as well. Uh. Honesty, honesty, honesty. Mm. Anyway, congratulations. Hello, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, yeah, let's go to you in the dark, dark hair. Yeah. Um, hi, Sir Ian. Hello. Um, throughout your acting career, you've brought many wonderful characters to life, from Gandalf to my personal favorite being Macbeth. And I was wondering which one of these characters you've uh, played has been your favorite, or the one that's you've mm. 
It's like it the most. It's you know, always the, the part. It, 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 it's the play, it's the production, it's the filming, it's the other people who are in it. It's the stuff that you learnt about yourself and about the character. Uh, and if I say that that, that production of um, Macbeth with Judy Dench that came out of the Royal Shakespeare Company and you can still get on v uh, DVD, as a, the, <laughs> or I, I don't get any money out of it, 1976 we did that. I would think that's one of the things I'm most proud of, but not because I like the character of Macbeth at all. But, uh, uh, you know, I'm extremely lucky. I, I suppose I've, I've played about 250 or so parts. And only two of those jobs do I regret. I learned something from all of them. And that's been, always been the basis of, of what I wanted to do in, in picking a part. Will I learn anything from it? Can I get better as an actor? I just had that revelation I was telling you about with, uh, with King Lear. Um, yeah, Macbeth will do. <laughs> and Gods and Monsters for a film. Uh, that, that, uh, if you don't know that, I do recommend it. Very good film about uh, Hollywood in the 1930s. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's go to you in the very back of the purple jacket. Yeah. Just wait for the microphone. Hello, Sir Ian. Hello. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you had any advice for somebody wanting to go into a career in theater or the performing arts, but perhaps has a degree or doctorate in something completely <laughs> irrelevant to <laughs> that. Uh, have I got advice for anyone going, wanting to act? No, oh dear. No, not really, because I don't, I don't know you. I don't know the person you might be talking about, but uh, uh, I didn't go to drama school. Others did. I learnt on the job. Uh, others learnt the te the, the, their techniques in an academic way. I don't know. I think you have to... Uh, two things I could recommend is to look at other people's acting. Particularly in the company of a like-minded friend. Uh, if, if you go and, go and see something at the Playhouse here and then work out afterwards why it was rubbish or why it wasn't. <laughs> and if you can't afford the theatre, go to the movies. If you can't afford the movies, watch TV together. <coughs> why is she so good? How, how's that achieved? Well, you can freeze frame and uh, talk about it and learn hugely and equally from a performance you don't think is any good and if you don't fancy doing that well just sit on a bus and look at people because I, I let you into a secret all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely <laughs> players <laughs> You see, we're all acting. That's what human beings do. And Shakespeare knew that. Life's but a walking shadow, Macbeth says. <coughs> Life is but a walking shadow. There's a phrase in, in British literature, walking gentleman. It, it's, it's, it's a person who plays odd little parts. Life's not even a walking gentleman. Life's a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage. That's what life is. He's constantly using that metaphor, Shakespeare. It's one big gift to us, is to define us as actors. Because animals don't act. A leopard could change its spots, but it's still a leopard, that's the point. And we, we, I mean, when you got up this morning, you decided what costume you would wear. Oh, should I dress up? Oh, no, I'm going to a lecture. Well, no, I'll dress down. <laughs> <laughs> but then I'd like to wear something tonight. All right, I'll take a little bag with, what, a costume in it? How should I have my hair? It's all. Didn't you find 
I did when I was at school. I spoke with a different accent at school because the boys had a stronger northern accent than we used at home. There is language that you will use with your friends you wouldn't dream of using in front of your grandmother. <laughs> You're able, we are so adept at being different because we keep showing different sides, a little bit of ourselves. And the only person who ever gets to know you really well is the one you love, with whom you do not act. Or rather, you act together. And I, that bit of philosophy comes directly from Shakespeare. So, uh, <coughs> studying acting in order to become a professional actor, you're doing an Im intensely human activity. That's uh, it's why we like actors. They're so human and frail. Oh, dear. <laughs> Please don't fall over now. <laughs> yeah, let's go to you. Hi, thank Hello. you for um, coming this evening. I have a question about Lord of the Rings. Uh, <laughs> it was going to come up eventually. Um, my question is, Lord of the Rings is so huge and it's one of the most famous roles you've ever played. What do you think it is about Lord of the Rings that makes it so popular and yeah. why it speaks to so many people? What is it about Lord of the Rings that makes it so popular? That, well, a local author. Well done, Oxford. Um, <coughs> One of the reasons I didn't write my autobiography was because I couldn't work out who I was going to write it for. If I put RSC, would my reader know that was the Royal Shakespeare Company? And if they didn't, how was I going to start explaining what the Royal Shakespeare Company was? Who founded it? Why? Where it was? Who is Shakespeare? Oh my God, where do you stop? <laughs> uh, he began with The Hobbit, didn't he, uh, Tolkien? And he knew who he was writing for. He's writing for his children, his son. And I think you can tell that not just in The Hobbit, But in the, in the sequel, the, the greater book, Lord of the Rings, uh, the adventure is one that he knows is going to appeal to uh, his, his young reader. And uh, it, it has such an impact uh, on, on a young reader or on a young viewer of the films that it, it stays, stays with them and, 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 and enriches uh, itself. Uh, I, 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 Tolkien is, is a wonderful writer and, and he's as adept as Charles Dickens, I think, in, in, in sketching out a scene. He can, with the minimum of words, tell you where you are. And, and you may be somewhere absolutely fantastic. Whether that's achieved in the films is uh, 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 up to you to, to judge, but uh, I suppose it is that it's all about life and a view of life and a, a concern for good and evil. How could that not be engaging? Um, it seems to be about something that matters. Uh, and yet it's in a strange world that is familiar. In other words, I don't know. <laughs> Let's come to you. Hello. Um, firstly, uh, as a gay South African, I'd like to thank you for speaking to our former president because <laughs> my life could have been quite different otherwise. Uh, my question is simple but somewhat personal. Do you still have your tattoo from the Lord of the Rings films? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Got to see it. <laughs> he says, so I still have my tattoo. Well, well, you can't have it. Well, you can have a tattoo removed, can't you? 
no. Well, I'm not going to show you now. It's, uh, uh, there's, um, it's just there. All the members of the fellowship, nine of us, went, went down to uh, 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 a tattoo artist in Cuba Street in, in Wellington. There, there are a number of them. Uh, a lot of tattoos go on in, in New Zealand. Maori, in particular, love. And, and look gorgeous. Uh, we, we just had the word for nine in Elvish. I don't know what that word is, actually. <laughs> And, and, and when I look at it uh, infrequently, it's upside down. And it seems to spell Gucci. <laughs> and of course, I, I do know what Gucci means because I have this chain of um, uh, this fashion houses that I told you about at the beginning. Whereabouts in South Africa? Johannesburg. Johannesburg. I'm going to have Christmas in uh, Cape Town. Mm. I mean, we're sort of, you know, enemies. It's like Oxford and Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Great. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, let's go to you. Yeah. Yeah, you. Please? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, if you just wait for the mic. You just wait for the microphone. I don't know. Oh, wait, is it, it was, I was looking at this person just behind the blonde girl in that corner. Yeah, stand up, just so I know. It's, yeah, yeah. Ah, there you Thank are. you for coming this evening. Um, I was wondering, you've talked about this wide variety of roles that you've had, um, you've done, but is there any role that you really want to play in the future, or that you'd like to actually revisit with a new perspective? Hmm. No. <laughs> I've, ne I've never had a list. I mean, some people say, I want to play Napoleon. Do you? Well, yeah. I have played Napoleon, actually, uh, in a little play by Bernard Shaw about Napoleon as a young man. Well, it depends who's written it, doesn't it? I want to be in a great movie about Napoleon. Yeah, but that's, that would be different. No. There are a few parts I wish I had played, which is too late now. Sorry. Um, I've always thought I'd, I'd make a rather good Mercutio, and it's not too late because Mercutio uh, hangs about with the, with the, with the lads <laughs> and uh, is pretty disparaging about women. I think he could be played as a rather bitter old queen. <laughs> and unfortunately, my own mate Derek Jacobi got there first. He's just played him uh, as exactly that uh, in Ken Branagh's production in the West End, so I've missed my chance for that. Well, uh, King Lear, I wanted to do again, and I have, as I say, just done it. No, the thing I most want to do next is what I've always wanted to do, is, is a new piece of work. Uh, and, and every film you do is a new piece of work, because on the whole, films are always new scripts. But uh, if someone could uh, write me a wonderful play, not, not a one-man show, uh, yeah. I don't, have, I don't have much time left, you know. I, I don't know if you... Can you imagine what that's like? People don't warn you about getting old. They don't warn you that when you get to my age, you talk about death, as I've started to do. As I would do if I were in the company of people of my age. How are you? Ooh, dreadful. dreadful. <laughs> Can't see anymore. Oh, really. Worried about where you're going to live. Anyone, got anyone to look after you? No. <laughs> And then I come to do King Lear for the second time and realise King Lear never stops saying, I'm old. <laughs> well, he is, he's 80 odd. I'm old. And when you're old, you think, oh, there's not much future left, and uh, what am I going to do? So it, it would be good for me to think about what I would like to do because it would keep that part of me uh, young. Sorry to be depressing, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's a fact. Death is a fact of life. It's going to happen. You don't believe it, do you? <laughs> and, and someone said to me, is it true that the first person to live to the age of 200 is already alive? Oh, wow. Why the hell would you want to be 200? <laughs>
but um, yeah. Of course, what you want to do when you're, when you're old is be in the company of young people because inside you, you, you feel the same, really. It's, it's, it's so odd when you look in the mirror, who the hell's that? <laughs> mm. Sorry. <laughs> got time for one You'd or think I was drunk, more. wouldn't you? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> we had some wine at dinner. <laughs> one or two more. Let's go for you. Hello, thank you for speaking to us tonight. So, um, my question is slightly different. Um, so, now that you're roughly 11 months out from the last airing of Vicious, which was a rather different role and somewhat relates to your own life, yeah. How do you feel about it? Do you think it was important also just with the times internationally that we're having? Thank you. Do, do you know, uh, who, who knows what Vicious is? Uh, not many. <laughs> not many. It was a sitcom that Derek Jacobi, uh, an actor of my age and, and, and experience, uh, did for uh, commercial television here. For, I th do we do three seasons or two? Two and a half. Uh, and we were lambasted because it, it, was, it was thought, as we were playing two gay men uh, and rather caricature characters, that we were somehow falling into the old habit of uh, mocking gay people, as, as if Derek and I <laughs> would do that. Ridiculous. Uh, and they missed the point that we were uh, wanting the, it to look like an old sitcom. But those two old men who'd lived together for 50 years and come through uh, were rather heroic in my view. They were quite open about their sexuality in, in the stories. Uh, they may have spoken absolutely horribly to each other and been disgusting to women and, and, and young women at that and, and, uh, and have very limited views about, about life in general. But they were survivors and how could you not like them? Uh, that's what I felt. But. Uh, we, we both found it difficult to do uh, it being uh, performing for television in front of a live audience is what you do with a sitcom. And of course, when Derek and I, stage actors, smell an audience, we, ca we, we can't wait to start acting for them and, and that's not required on television, which is the cameras are very close. So I think we both felt that uh, we'd, we'd, we'd done enough and uh, but enjoyed it. And I remember we used to talk to the audience in between the filming. And uh, of about 500 people, I don't know where they came from, <laughs> but they did. And, and, I, and I, I used to ask them each week, I said, up those stairs, uh, there's a bedroom. The characters keep going to it. A bedroom, and in the bedroom, there is what? Two single beds? or one double bed. Now, this is a story about two 70-year-old men. Universally, every week, everybody said, it's a double bed. In other words, they imagined that these two 70-year-olds were having sex. And I thought, well, that's pretty modern. <laughs> it's always been a fact of life, but it's not something that people would uh, admit, or certainly not on primetime television in a sitcom. And one night after it was over, we, took, we came out, we took our bows, and I said, I just want to tell you that across the Thames, in the House of Commons, whilst you were watching Vicious tonight, it became legal for gay men and women to marry each other. Well, that audience, bless their hearts, they stood up and cheered and, oh. You, th you throw these things into the mix, and uh, are, are we ending now? One more. <laughs> one more. All right. Do you want to pick this one? Make it a good one. Who's got the best question? <laughs> no? You choose. Yeah, you're very keen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you. Either. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm a Northerner, so. Yes, yay. very nice. Um, 
Uh, just uh, sort of, of all the wigs and costumes you've worn, which was the best and which was the most uncomfortable, horrible? Just, just but random, sort of throw that out there. That's a good question, isn't it? So I'm, I'm going to have to think about this one. Which is the most uncomfortable costume? Oh, Magneto. <laughs> oh. It was, all, it was all little bits and they all stuck together and, and, and oh, you could hardly walk on moving them. Dreadful helmet. <laughs> Silly looking helmet. Uh, Gandalf, fancy free, you know, just, just flowing around. <laughs> but I wonder if you noticed in, occasionally when the, the skirt uh, blew in the wind that you could see the unmistakable shape of uh, a book, which was the... Uh, three-volume edition of Lord of the Rings, which I always kept uh, in the costume uh, to refer to and say uh, to Peter Jackson, uh, I've just been reading through the scene we're going to do today. There are a few lines of Gandalf that have been cut here. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Uh, well, I've done it once today, so I, <laughs> no, I, I, I say to the, uh, the children, it would be true of you, you, you know, if you have, when you have examinations, you have to work very hard for them, you have to prepare for them, you have to do your revision for them, you have to take them seriously, it's going to change your life if it all works out. But if you don't do your revision, if you don't work hard, then you shall not pass! <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, if you look in the book, he never says that line. <laughs> <laughs> he says, you cannot pass. I got it wrong. <laughs> and it doesn't matter. But uh, here's a speech that does matter, and uh, it's by Shakespeare. And it's a precious speech, personally, and, and, and for you, too, because uh, it's from a play that he helped to write. Uh, it's an oddity people forget that uh, in Elizabethan times, plays were written often by a group of uh, authors. And together with others, Shakespeare wrote a play called uh, Sir Thomas More, about the Catholic martyr. And it was never performed in his lifetime. Uh, nor for centuries afterwards, until 1964, the, the centenary of Shakespeare's birth, when I got to play Thomas More. So you're looking at the last actor who will ever be able to say, I created a part by William Shakespeare. <laughs> uh, that's the personal side. The, the general interesting thing is that uh, a copy of this speech I'm going to do for you, in Shakespeare's own handwriting, uh, is in the British Museum. Or is, it, or is it the British Library? One or the other. It's on permanent display. It should be. It's the only example of uh, a Shakespeare text in his handwriting. And it's this speech. And it's all about what we've been mainly talking about today. There, there's a riot in London. Uh, 16th century, Henry VIII. And... Uh, and it's the, it's the young apprentices, mainly, who are out on the streets. And uh, they're complaining about uh, the immigrants in London taking our jobs. They call them strangers. 
and they're causing a fuss, and uh, Thomas More, um, a lawyer, is sent out to put it right. Bank down the riot. May Day riots. And uh, he does it in two ways, by telling them that you, you, can't, you, can't, have a, you, you can't shout like that in public, you, you can't cause a f disturbance, you can't be violent. It's against the law. And then being by Shakespeare, he says, and you can't do it because be humane. So someone in the crowd shouts that the strangers should be removed, and Thomas More uh, says, grant them removed, and grant that this your noise hath chid down all the majesty of England. Imagine that you see the wretched strangers, their babies at their backs, with their poor luggage plodding to the ports and coasts for transportation, and that you sit as kings in your desires, authority quite silenced by your brawl, and you in wrath of your opinions clothed. What had you got? You had taught how insolence and strong hand should prevail, how order should be quelled. And by this pattern, not one of you should live an aged man, for other ruffians, as their fancies wrought, with self-same hand, self-reason, and self-right, would shark on you, and men like ravenous fishes feed on one another. You'll put down strangers, kill them, cut their throats, and lead the majesty of law in Lyam to slip him like a hound, O oh, desperate as you are, wash your foul minds with tears, and those same hands that you, like rebels, lift against the peace, lift up for peace, and your unreverent knees make them your feet to kneel to be forgiven. Say now, the king, as he is clement, if the offender mourn, should so much come too short of your great trespass as but to banish you, whither would you go? What country, by the nature of your error, should give you harbour? Go you to France or Flanders, to any German province, Spain or Portugal, nay, anywhere that not adheres to England, why, you must needs be strangers. Would you be pleased to find a nation of such barbarous temper that breaking out in hideous violence would not afford you an abode on earth, whet their detested knives against your throats, spurn you like dogs, and like as if God owned not, nor made not you, nor that the elements were not all appropriate to your comfort, but chartered unto them, what would you think to be thus used? This is the stranger's case, and this your mountainish inhumanity. Thank you.